Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Christophe, for inviting us today in Warsaw. And um, it's interesting that I'll come at the end because several questions have been raised today for amongst the excellent presentation that we've heard about. And uh, also by the superb presentation from Pietro Maino, who talked about simplicity. And my talk also will be a sort of tribute to the one who trained us, of course, and a tribute to our last, uh, latest companion, Gilles Monta, Castro de Souza, Nakash, Capusotti, and Miguel Sardulo, lately from Argentina, who left us. So, my talk was about, sorry, about the liver surgery between art and technology. If I may say, I will uh, divide the concept of this organ, this marvelous organ, this liver, between two phases in the history. The main discovery in this organ was done really late 19th century, and I will say the first uh, half, even more of the 20th century. And that was made by the reflection and the human. And certainly since Langeberg, who did the first hepatectomy in the late 19th century, a lot of things happened. Liver science developed, segmental anatomy, hepatectomy, segmental surgical oriented resection with the adjunction of the ultrasound, liver transplantation, reduced liver, split, laparoscopy, liver disease also has been, we have a, a better knowledge in that. And we reached the concept to do it to be more, I would say, precise in our indication and adaptive surgery. The 21st century though, and that happened, I will say, late 90s, certainly the five last years from uh, last century, things have changed. We reach another era, evidence-based medicine, standardization, quantification of surgical performance, the concept and the creation of more and more healthcare systems. We're not working alone. We work inside a structure which is inside the hospital, and the hospital itself is dependent of the politics of the country, who dictate us how to work in the future. And of course, big data, digitalization, internet, machine learning, artificial intelligence. And that came with the creation of robotic surgery, and certainly we're going to go, and that's the new phase, autonomous surgical robots. So these are, I would say, the genius of the liver. And certainly since Prometheus and the concept of regenerative liver surgery, then Quino with his segmental anatomy, then Langeberg, then Pringle maneuver with who, in my mind, it did a simple thing, but reduced dramatically the complication after surgery. Thomas Tarzel, of course, with the transportation, and of course, Professor Bismuth, who created the concept of the precise liver surgery, and together with liver transplantation, we've managed to do split, reduced liver, and of course, living-related liver transplantation, who came later. So, as I said, it started with the development and the understanding of mechanism of regeneration, principle of reperfusion, tumor biology, refinement surgical technique, the adjunction in the 80s of the ultrasound who helped us to do the segmented oriented resection as uh, Professor Guido Torzilli has spoke about earlier. And of course, with the radiology, it was parallel to the liver surgery. And with this, we've managed to create the uh, concept of portal vein embolization and then the ops and mini ops because we know that we can resect more than we think and the patient can still survive even a major resection. But then again, once we've done the technolic techniques, I would say, uh, progress, we had to assess, is this useful? How are we going? Are we going to do a right hepatectomy for every single HCC or clad skin or uh, colorectal liver meds or breast liver metastasis or neuroendocrine. So it was important to start to think if what we're doing is correct or not. And indeed, this question has been answered since the 80s and the 90s. And that's how we started to more be precise in our indication saying, 
we do transplantation for more than three, less than three centimeter. The concept of the non-resectable colorectal metastasis to the, uh, uh, with the aid of the neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and certainly Professor René Adam has become a pioneer in this concept, and later we're going to listen about the bulking liver surgery. And of course, the clad skin and the cholangiocarcinoma. And if I may recall, uh, Pietro Magno spoke about simplicity. I mean, this is for me the best classification for hyla cholangiocarcinoma. Unfortunately, we read about perihyla cholangiocarcinoma, and we do a more complex definition rather than to use the simplest one. So as I said, and thanks to the previous um, speaker about the radiology, indeed helped us a lot. I mean, we started with the ultrasound, now we had the 3D, now we had the 3D reconstruction. I certainly myself started to measure the first step of volumetry. We, we used to calc and put all the paper and wet them, but now we can calculate easier what's the uh, future remnant lever volume and even the concept of the function, and now we can map before the surgery. Certainly, in this context, the surgery became more easier. We are more adapted to the patient. And of course, it answered a lot of questions. The, certainly, the revised the resist guideline helped us to answer some questions and to make our life, I would say, a little bit easier. So indeed, technology, in the instruments, the ligature, for example, the CUSA, it's better than to do the digitoclasy or the keliclasy, and the operation from maybe six hours became three hours liver surgery. So it wasn't going to take a long time to create this image-guided guided surgery, and that opened the door from the laparoscopy to the robotic surgery. So we are I would say the human mind is genius. So you say we, don't, we are not static, we go further and further and further. And now with the uh, parallelism, I would say with the uh, aeronautic, so we create a big simulator. I mean, someone asked a question how the future surgeon is going to be trained. Well, I have to say it started already. We have simulators, it's exactly like pilot. We use the virtual glasses, then you can navigate inside the human body you can do a right hepatectomy, so you can do a lot. So training is not going to, to take longer, and the, certainly the future generation will be labeled surgeon without touching the patient. This is the future, and this is how, where we're going, we're heading. So another concept that came in the light in the late 90s, starting the 21st century, and impacted dearly our thinking in matter of liver surgery is the evidence-based surgery because now we have to make sure that it has to be a patient-oriented practice and that has to be uh, supported by evidence. So everybody was warning about the evidence. Certainly it came from medicine, evidence-based medicine with a randomized control trial and it's an approach that facilitate cl clinical decision uh, making best on evidence. Because you have to think that we're not working alone. We work in a, in a vast community that it's called the planet Earth. And you have to make sure that we speak the same language, whether you are India or in Africa or in Europe or South America or USA, when we speak about uh, transplantation or right hepatectomy or a segmentectomy, you have to make sure that we speak about the same thing. And definitely, there was a, a, an increased demand of having evidence to support that. And what happened is that beginning of the 21st century, we discovered that there was a discipline, we were very bad, bad in evidence. If you can see that treatment of hepatocellular carcinoma, which was graded D, and hepatic resection for colorectal liver met was C. So there was a demand of no more retro retrospective studies. We have to go for RCT, prospective trial, and we have to come up with some guidelines. And it was important so that everybody was happy about it. It wasn't the case. It opened the door of the, I would call it the publish or perish uh, context. 
everybody wanted to publish, whether you have a, a series of 10 or 20 patients, it doesn't matter as long as statistically you were right. And I like this uh, paper. I mean, in one year, Annals of Surgery just reported how many papers were talking about control trial, methodological systematic review, incorporation, uh, patient-centered outcome. So we were focusing more about methodology rather than treating the patient. So we created a god. Its name is P less, not 0.5. So uh, this is the new god of the new scientific thinking. Was it enough? It wasn't enough, of course not, because who wasn't happy? The healthcare system wasn't happy. And the problem is that despite of being very good in statistics, we have to have consensus. It was the, uh, I would say, the race about consensus, guidelines, transparent data, and indeed, that's how we started by creating these medical societies. And I wouldn't criticize them because it is important to obey to a certain logic in this thinking. And from international societies to registries, and these are, I would say, internationally uh, accepted uh, scientific body to tell us what sort of guidelines and to create standardization, make sure that we speak about things, make sure that we follow the same principle. And in the literature, of course, we have a lot of statistical model. If you want to label the quality of randomized uh, control trial, you use JADAC score, consort statement, level of quality of evidence, the great system, Validation of recommendation, you use the Delphi method. Evaluation of surgical invasion, ideal system. And of course, the appraisal, because you have to appraise the appraiser. So in that case, you use the agree instrument. So you see our mind is still going on. And I don't know why we love mathematics, we love statistics. I don't, but never mind. We have to learn something new. And indeed, for the uh, innovation, and that has been applied uh, for laparoscopy, and I remember when uh, Professor Cherki was talking about the new consensus, uh, they used the ideal framework for surgical innovation, because indeed, it has nothing to do when you test a new drug. This is, we're talking about surgery. It's not the same, and I have to say that the ideal framework is good. So, you appraise, you have the ideal, and there we are in the beginning of the 21st century, and we are caught up with the precision surgery, defining benchmarking for living uh, transplantation, for liver surgery, and that is to evaluate the surgical performance. It's to say that if you're doing well or you're doing bad. From there, we have the standard of nomenclature, like, uh, for example, everybody remembered the Brisbane classification. So we, ha we were happy with the uh, classification of crino and the hepatectomy, but now we are the sectionectomy. There you are. We keep on changing. So who's happy with that? Certainly, you have winners and losers. The winners are, I would say, the healthcare control, autorité de santé, nice, NICE, it's the uh, English, and NHIC is from the USA. The loser is your intellectual freedom because you will need some budget, you, will, you don't have the uh, total freedom to create a project or research if it hasn't been validated. And that creates a problem. And I will give you an example of what happened in UK. This is an example how it works. So that was a national guideline for uh, colorectal cancer, the uh, cancer services in HPB services. And they came up with these formal things that you have to obey. Otherwise, if you fail to comply, you will have financial penalties. So that has transformed also the way we work because we have to obey, otherwise you wouldn't have any funding. So are these guidelines the gold standard? I'm not sure about it. So more and more, these uh, uh, national uh, or uh, local authorities, they are happy with this new system. Healthcare regulation, 
regulators will create more regulation. High-tech company are going to facilitate that. But the loser is us. No more human factor, and the intellectual freedom is gone. And I like this paper, which has been published fairly recently from this uh, uh, Mr. Steele, colorectal surgeon, never forget the one behind the algorithm. Algorithm is good, but you have to think outside the box. There will always be a patient who doesn't fit any of these boxes, but you can still, as a surgeon, save him or her. So standardization. This is the new era. It's a rule-based practice. It's quality assessment. It's following guideline. And of course, artificial intelligence has been created. Today, you even have, uh, I read recently, you have a new department in New York, which is called Artificial Intelligence Department of Surgery. You just wonder, what the hell is that? You don't know what it is. Because uh, Hugo Pinto Marcus spoke about the robotic surgery, which is good. Of course, it helps you. It's uh, more precise. You're not so tired as a surgeon. But how does it work? Nobody knows. And it's not long before the robot surgeon is going to be complete autonomous. That's coming from the concept of machine learning, the e-learning, and everybody heard about the deep learning. And certainly, it was uh, really adapted from the aerospatial and aeronautic uh, concept. And apparently, studies have found that all the training exercise are improved by the simulator performance. So if you ask me tomorrow, uh, are we going, uh, how is it going to be a surgical training? I think, personally, it's going to be in a simulator. You're going to use virtual reality, and that's how you're going to be uh, completely trained. Problem is that, is that you have to think that every single hospital, every healthcare system, are thinking about actual performance. And problem is that you, as a surgeon, you're limited by the fatigue, you're limited by maybe the surgical tremor, and you cannot perform. Uh, if you think that uh, you're going to do a 10 cholangiocarcinoma in a day, I don't think so. And it was one uh, difficulty that it's going to be overcome in the near future, because robotic surgery, no fatigue, no resistance, large axial movement, and the adjunction of the artificial intelligence will reduce technical errors and remove the potential human error. And indeed, the past 10 years, you had a lot published about it. You ha even have a, a recent prowess. People are using robotic uh, uh, device to do a liver transplant. So you have to think, is that going to be the future? I doubt it. It is, for me, more a performance then it's something that is going to be applied everywhere. And as uh, someone said earlier, it's very expensive. But people have already calculated that the money spent on a training surgeon is more expensive to buy one robot. So in the future, that's what they are going to do. And if I think about the Davishin system that was created in 2000, 20 years later, we already have a new generation. And this is the new era of the, smart, the STAR system, which is the smart tissue autonomous robot. And that it is, you have to learn about these terms because you're going to read about it more and more. Alpha's framework, which is the untrained robot trained via multimodal source of data. So we're not training a human being. We're now going to train a robot. And it, indeed, it's changing the society. Because the pandemic recently taught us that we all use digital, we all use internet. You do the clinic consultation via the, uh, the, the, the computer. We were all uh, completely expert with Zoom. So less and less you're going to need to uh, see a proper doctor. And that is going to be rapidly disseminated of these surgical skills via internet and via the virtual learning. And if I look at that, People who came up with that, these engineering and the high-tech uh, people, came up by comparing the surgeon versus robot surgeon, and they compared that to the uh, automobile industry. 
just to show you how they see us. And this is the fourth and the fifth. It's the uh, full automation of the device. And I invite you to read this uh, article who speaks a lot about artificial intelligence, where they show you that the surgical robot has senses and analyze his uh, environment. He has an internal microprocessor and then with the deep learning and he can calculate itself the output and give you the answer. So the, it will resolve the problem indeed. It won't create a problem, but it's all based on calculation. So you ask yourself, where are we going? And me, certainly as a surgeon, when I started, so you learn how the anatomy, you know the body, you know the disease, and now you became statistician, and now you have to be a technician. You have to learn all these words. This is a new language, and we have to be really familiar. And interestingly, if I looked about the more recent publication, and that's in Annals of Surgery, I have to familiarize myself with machine learning, with blueprint, with natural language processing. These papers were not all written by surgeons. They were written also by either mathematicians, statisticians, and engineering. So next step, they want to even forecast innovation as if you can quantify innovation in surgery. And when you think about it, it's based only by analysis of peer-reviewed publication, it's a database publication, and it's a new methodology which is integrated in a new framework. And I do not agree about the word of innovation. For me, it's not innovation, it's progress in technology. If you focus on the word innovation, innovation appeal to the more artistic, artist, artistic part of the human being. You have to be imaginative, you have to be creative, you have to be a dreamer, you have to observe, you have to have a lot of empathy, and you have to feel emotion. Without that, reduced liver was created because you wanted to save a mother and a child. Neoadjuvant chemotherapy and the concept of downstaging came by uh, observing the result, how you see the tumor who was deemed in unresectable before became resectable, and then we decided to go further and do resection. Technical error, the machine doesn't make an error, but without a technical error, Schnitzbauer will never, never created the ALPS procedure. The same from uh, the discovery of cyclospor cy cyclosporine, who was a major uh, advance in uh, transplantation, and it was just by, it was an antifungal, transformed to immunosuppressant. And to remind you is that they tested on themselves. And as Albert Einstein said, imagination is more important than knowledge. So I'll give you, if you see the first sculpture is um, Dali, inspired by Newton and the concept of gravity. Gravity, the same. How did Newton uh, uh, created this formula who, just by observing an apple, and Dali was inspired to create this uh, sculpture. And this is the thumb of Salvador Dali, which is the philosophical definition of a human being with the penseur of Rodin, the mind, the hand. Gustave Eiffel, I have an idea better than myself. It was supposed to be a temporary, it's still there. You have one Eiffel Tower, you won't have two. And of course, the marvelous sculpture of the hand of Caesar, the, 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 the sculptor, sculpture, I don't know how to say. Uh, I have to thank Professor Bismuth of this marvelous paper, Discovery and Innovation in Surgery. And certainly I was inspired by him to uh, create this talk. So art and surgery, creativity, unique, inspiring. Who inspires you? It's the school of the masters. The masters, you have to have a master. School of Picasso, who trained this uh, uh, painter, Miro, and you can see that he was influenced by him. Socrates trained Plato, Plato trained uh, Aristotle, and that's how you have to have a mentoring, and you have to have a master to teach you and to help you how to think 
and not to be faced with the problem. As we say, every single problem has a solution. And of course, this is a tribute to one of our colleagues, Jean-Robert Delperro. He's a marvelous surgeon, pancreatic surgeon, but also a marvelous artist. And I thank him uh, to invited me to see his uh, exhibition. So the School of Master, I'm glad to be uh, amongst uh, uh, the school of uh, Monsieur Bismuth, who trained us all. And we, as uh, his student, we have to continue to train and to make sure that we are not going to be completely closed in, uh, in uh, uh, machinery uh, factory uh, school. an extra from modern time, which I think it's still a very modern movie. So, having said that, my best definition of a surgeon came from Paul Valéry, who did this marvelous talk in 1936, and saying that the surgeon is an artist, because his work is not a simple repetition of the same and the same and the same operation. And whatever we do uh, in the future, you will have to keep the mind of the, um, of the human being rather than the one of the uh, machine who dictate us what to do. Can I go to the last slide, please? And to finish, keep the human factor integrated in any uh, concept in the future, and that will be the future of the human humanity. And I thank you, everybody, for uh, being patient and listening to me. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gina. Probably I was right that it was especially for you. Not just, not only, especially for you. And it was an exciting trip between uh, the simplicity of Pietro to your balance. Uh, we often uh, say that we have a time of sowing, a time of harvest. I think my master, that today we've ha we have your time of harvest. Because your owing and personal engagement to our, to our learning, to our training, uh, permit today to me say that today we have, nowadays we have your time of harvest. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, Gina. <laughs>